Okay, have, hello everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. Um, I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com, uh, information, resources, services, uh, events and activities for the global medcoms community, by which I'm talking to people who work in and around medical communications, medical education and medical publishing, and indeed uh, for people who want to join medcoms. Um, you'll find there's a lot going on. Do have a look at medcomsnetworking.com if, you, if you're not aware of those activities. Um, you'll find that we do a lot of webinars and various recordings of, of various shapes and sizes, um, which are collected together at Network Pharma TV. So it's worth having a look at that. Uh, there's now over 300 videos there, all relevant to Medcoms. Um, and specifically to anybody who's watching this who um, is interested in Medcoms as a business to join, uh, take a look at firstmedcomsjob.com, where there's lots of free resources there for you, careers guides, articles, videos, and so on and so forth. So lots and lots going on. Uh, we're talking to you today on uh, June the 9th, uh, 2021, and I will say that uh, clearly, it is Medcoms Day, it's our 10th Medcoms Day. Um, so um, I'm absolutely delighted today that we have got, um, as I'm calling them, a stellar panel um, from McCann. Uh, Charlie and uh, Bomi and Faye and Michael, thank you very much for joining. And we've got the UK and the US represented, which sort of gives that sort of sense of internationalism, which is great. We've got a big audience online with us and we've seen from their comments coming in that they're from all over the world as well. So um, on a day, on Medcoms Day, which is about the global community, it's great to have the global representation here um, and to have a, a, an agency like McCann that spans the globe uh, coming and talking to us. And we want to talk about the the brilliant, um, the exciting outlook for med medical communications um, uh, globally. Um, we're going to start with a very brief sort of introduction presentation, and then we're just going into Q and A. And we're going to be, we're sort of going to be winging it. Okay, um, we've got a couple of topics in mind, but we're very keen that the audience who are watching us um, comes at us with their questions and their comments, and we will basically be led by you. So, anything goes, guys. Uh, please do use the text boxes that you've got, the chat box and the Q and A box to communicate with us. So without further ado, um, I'm simply gonna say thank you very much guys for joining me and I'm gonna start by uh, handing over to Charlie to introduce himself, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Hi everyone, uh, absolutely delighted to be here. And first let me say happy Medcoms Day um, and congratulations, Peter, on, on making it to the 10th event. Um, fantastic <laughs> effort. Uh, so I'm Charlie Rockwell. I head up the uh, medical communications business in McCann Health. I'll hand over to Bommy to give a brief intro. Hello, uh, my name is Hola Bomi Oladosu, I go by Bomi. Um, I'm a medical writer at uh, Complete Health Vision, and I'm also a member of the Diversity Inclusion Council um, for McCann Health Medical Communications. Faye? Okay, yeah, my name is Faye Daly. I'm part of the HR team. I'm also a, a mental health first aider. I've been with the company now for 11 years this year, so it's quite some time. I'm very excited to be here today. Happy Medcoms Day. Go Michael. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. I'm Michael Stevenson. I'm one of the newest members of the uh, McCann Health Medcoms team. I'm the global agency head for Caudex. Uh, really excited to be here today. I bring 20 years of uh, Medcoms experience working uh, in this crazy wonderful business that we're all in. Um, and it's nice to see so many of uh, our colleagues and uh, some old friends uh, joining us today. Thanks for having us. Great. So as, as Peter mentioned, I'm going to start with just a couple of slides in part to introduce our business, our company, our people, but also to maybe provide some stimulus hopefully for questions uh, through the session. So I'll just share my screen. Hopefully this works. Can everybody see that OK? Mm -hmm. Great. So firstly, just to say that uh, we, as McCann Health Medical Communications, we have uh, distinct agencies within our group, but we're talking today as our overall group. And in that group, we have around 520 people, just over, very highly qualified team with a high number of uh, advanced degrees in the team. Uh, we are located, and I used to say offices here, but perhaps that's part of the discussion today as well. We are located in the UK, uh, US and Canada primarily, but we're also part of a truly global network and we do work with other parts of the network in bringing value to, to clients. So we can talk about that as well. Um, we have many long-term relationships with top pharma companies. And I'm very proud of those relationships, some 25 years plus, and, and a mix of global, regional and national work. Uh, and in addition, we have a mix of medical affairs, publications and commercial work. And not to forget, uh, importantly, our regulatory team who are a specialist part of the business who support regulatory submissions. 
And we also have a mix of multi-channel, strategic, more creative work. Um, and this is bringing a great deal of variety, I think, to, to the business and opportunity for people to look on different types of the work we do under the banner of Medcoms. We also have account, a client's accounts that are either standalone, we have a direct relationship, it's a piece of business that we have, or we have collaborative accounts which work with other parts of our network and that enables, enables us to bring different disciplines and geographic insights to the table. Um, and we're very proud of the work we do. And the reason why probably everyone on this call is in the business is many examples of work that we do that has made a, a meaningful difference to health and outcomes. And we also get outstanding staff and client feedback, you know, both directly, but also in third party and benchmarked surveys uh, compared to industry standards, which we're very proud of as well. And that has led us all to achieve sustained growth over many years. And indeed, uh, in the past uh, year plus, um, a great deal of interest in us as a sector is leading to growth, I think, overall. Um, and overall, I think agility at scale is a theme that we want to perhaps get into. Yes, we're a larger player in the market, but we also are very much individual people working as teams with our clients at a human level. Uh, and that's how it works. And, and we are very proud of the ability to be agile at scale. And so two major themes I want to center on. One is about how we go about making a meaningful difference for our people and our community because of careers and culture. Uh, we place a great deal of emphasis on career futures and pathways and mapping. We have a program called Fuel, which is for early careers specifically. That's also a part of how we're thinking about further diversifying and being inclusive in our organization. Uh, mental health and well-being and DNI, uh, Bonnie and Faye will talk to you specifically as absolutely pivotal to how we are evolving as a business. And indeed, sustainability, uh, we're already making commitments uh, to that, and I can get into that if that's uh, of interest to the audience. Um, and indeed, the future of work, um, we're seeing redefined expectations, flexibility and choice is going to be an absolute theme, and no doubt we'll get into that. The other overall theme is about how we go about making a difference to health, uh, to our clients and their customers. Um, and certainly there's an evolving role of medical affairs, which has been accelerated through the pandemic, actually. And, and that's also fueling, I think, a transformative time, actually, for medical communications and a very exciting time uh, to be in this business. We are talking with a lot of clients about evidence strategy, consultancy at a very senior strategic level for how they're going to go out building, uh, applying and evaluating the impact of evidence. And then publications, still uh, a very hot topic in terms of innovation and enhancement. Uh, obviously, the shift to virtual has been a big theme and what is the future of congresses may come up today. And where we see as a very important shift is to data led experiences, particularly in HCP education. Uh, and indeed, that move from provision of information to engagement to experience, we think is going to be a, another infor important transformative uh, stage for the business. So those are really just areas of thought, stimulus, hopefully provocation that might uh, bring up discussions uh, through through this event. So I'm going to now stop sharing my screen again and hand back to you, Peter. Fantastic. Thanks, Charlie. Um, and I do think it's an exciting time. You know, it's easily said, and hopefully we'll explain that a little bit more. But I um, I was talking to someone the other day in a, in a little video thing, and I was saying I think the best is yet to come. Uh, but it's, it's been interesting to see how things have been evolving over the last 10, 15 years of, of, of while I've been doing Medcoms networking and comparing it with, with my background in Medcoms. So we've evolved a long way. But I think it's, you know, this last year has actually brought, you know, brought us to the fore in lots of different ways, um, which I think is absolutely fascinating to think about. Um, and maybe we can sort of sort of start there by looking back a little bit over the last year or so. Um, we have been in a very strange time. I mean, most of us have been locked down in one way or the other for the last what, a year, 18 months, whatever it is. Um, I guess as a global organization, you've sort of seen a bit of a domino effect and going mm. backwards and forwards, which must have been interesting. Um, but can we just start with the sort of, I mean, and, and there's, there's lots of issues about that and we could get bogged down in some of these, so we need to be a little bit careful. But I am interested in Faye to sort of like bring you in specifically, slightly setting you up here, but the sort of the mental first aid, mental health first aid type initiatives, you know, we're all, you know, I, I love this way of working, but I'm completely wrecked at the moment. Um, and, you know, I've got quite a lot of control of what I do. I, I can, I can, I deal with a lot of people in organizations and so on who are, who, are, who are or seem to be struggling as much as Medcom's agencies, I think, have been very good in supporting people. I think we're all struggling a little bit and mental health is something that's talked about a lot. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what you specifically do within, within McCann and some of your thoughts on on that aspect of, of, of what's happening at the moment, the changing work. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah. So obviously 
recent times have been really challenging for, for so many of us. And um, as an organization, we recognize that we need to make sure that people are looking after their physical health as well as their, their mental health as well. And we uh, recently invested in mental health first aiders in the UK and the US and in Canada as well. Um, so there was a number of us in the UK who did our training at the beginning of 2020 that was pre-pandemic. Little did we know what was, was going to yeah. be in store for us. Um, and then folks in the US and Canada did their training virtually, which was amazing that we were able to support that. And I'm, I'm really proud of the company for investing in our mental health first aiders. And it's really important as well just to just to say as well that all of these people who put themselves forward, they're all volunteering for this role. So, so we have 19 people who are qualified as mental health first aiders. And what they do, they are trained to spot those initial signs of uh, mental unwellness um, or emotional distress. They can always be used as well by line managers just to draw on for support as well. Um, and they also act as an advocate for raising awareness around mental health too. So how can we improve um, our workplace. Um, currently, as we're all working from home, we've been sharing tips on how to work from home effectively. Um, and it's all about just starting those conversations really and, and making our workplace really inclusive. And can you, I mean, can you just share like what's, I mean, I'm putting you on the spot here slightly, but what the couple of tips would you say just are just obvious top of the list sort of thing? I mean, for me personally, it's doing those little things each day that just helps. So I go out for a walk every single day with my dog in the morning and that just sets me up for the day. And it's making sure that you're taking breaks throughout the day as well. We talk about back to back meetings a lot and we've encouraged our employees to just shorten those a little bit, just take five minutes off. And that will really help just to give you that space in between. And, and those are just very simple tips that everybody could do. And it and they build up in a good way. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a blunt question and, I'm, and, and kick back if you want to, but I'm just sort of slightly intrigued. I mean, it's interesting that you, you what you're saying is you started the programme before the pandemic. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's a good positive thing that obviously the company was thinking in this direction. Um, well, I suppose what I ask or what I want to ask is if I can, is there some way of tracking the mental health of your staff do you track it can you go we're going up or down a slope I mean you know is there any measurement is there any tracking I don't know whether I'm asking an impossible question anyway so well we do have um we do ask our employees every year we do like an employee engagement survey okay. um and as part of that there are well-being questions included in that um, okay. So there was um, recently, there was one of the statistics from it was that 97% said that there's somebody at work who cares about them as a person, right. which I think is, is so important. Again, being a little bit provocative, sorry, but do you, do you run those surveys yourself or are they done independently? Uh, they're done ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, one of the things I, 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 I don't know whether you've seen the survey work that we did last year, which I thought was fascinating. We got a good number of people filling in and obviously, um, so there was a degree of independence. I, I, online surveys are always a little bit sort of whatever. So you've got to be a bit careful, but we got a lot of commentary back. Um, and I think what I, what stood out for me was how positive everybody was. However, if you dug down a bit, there was always a sort of 20, 25% of people who were stressed out or were having difficulties and all this stuff. And I certainly, you know, I, I, you know, I was banging on at the time about that. We've got to remember that sort of minority because, um, and, and what I used to say was, you know, I can be cheerful, I, you know, even as a grumpy old bloke, I can be reasonably cheerful on a Zoom call. I can turn the Zoom off and then I go and sob in the corner sort of thing. And I think <laughs> one of the things that I've had conversations and heard other people talking about is how important managers are at the moment, because it's, it's such, it's, it's really brought management to the fore because you have to actively manage because you're not just falling over someone in a corner, sobbing in the corner. You're actually having to, and I, I find all of that absolutely fascinating. So your sort of network of first aid and stuff, presumably, you know, champion the ideas and their mm. liaison and so on. And that's, that's all good stuff. So that's, that's well, interesting. Just add, Peter, I think a big part of the first aid program, the mental health first aid program is to bring a personal touch 
right. exact point. Mm -hmm. So it detunes it in terms of the scale of answering a major survey or, or escalating it through line management or HR channels. Those people are peers and bring a very personal touch to that engagement and discussion. And hopefully that helps foster more of those discussions. Because it, it can be difficult, can't it? You know, you don't, as an individual working organization, I don't really want to moan and, and everything else. So I'll just tell you everything's okay. And, and, and it, so it's a difficult management issue. I was just having a look, Victoria's just asked a question about what do you think about the, about the role of managers in the barometer of how people are feeling in terms of their well being? So I guess that's following on from what I said in the very specific, you're, you're basically saying they're, they're crucial, yeah? Yeah, yes. absolutely. And I think, and it, we even, um, we did some training for our line managers as well. We had a, a mental health nurse who, who did like a training session with all of our line managers, because we have a lot of line managers. So their role is, is super important in all of this. Okay, um, I'm just looking at Demetrius's question, which is, I guess, maybe slightly going off the topic, but now I've started looking at it. Um, he's saying he's seeing attempts to claw back remote work um, I guess to bringing it back in house, mm -hmm. just out of interest as a company, are you, uh, is, there, is there any difference now between what you're doing now and, and, and say a year or two ago in terms of outsourcing mm -hmm. to freelancers or, or not or whatever? Uh, Charlie, just briefly on that point, are you, is it? Yeah, just to say, you? say, first of all, we still, we still work um, with a lot of freelancers and we're in high demand as many, as many in the sector are. So I think that's, that's a, a topic in its own. In terms of remote working, you know, we're making it clear that we're not forcing anybody to go back into any office. Um, we, we are looking to open up as and when appropriate, safe to do so, but flexibility is going to be absolutely the key in the mantra. And we've done several pieces of work with our staff to understand what people want to do in the future. There's a big question about how is that then going to evolve over time? Yeah. And, okay. and that, that I think is, is very much an unknown and we're going to have to work with it and go, but for the foreseeable future, we're still going to have you know the vast majority of people either working remotely or in a flexible situation right right because i'm again it's a bit of a, a, a soapbox for me but it does make me laugh a little bit sometimes because i don't have an organization so i can talk like this i don't know the problems you have but at the end of the day um, a lot of us talk or a lot of organizations talk about being employee-led they've asked their employees what they want they're trying to help but actually if you've got mm -hmm. whether it's 30 or 300 or whatever they all come back with different answers, then you've sort of got a, a management and an organizational type issue again, because they can't all just work in their own it's way. Really adds, and I find adds that fascinating. It certainly adds complexity and there are clear yeah. needs and business needs to be taken into account. But you know, what we're trying to do is give as much flexibility as possible. There will be points in time in the future when we'll want to get people physically together for social connection and cohesion, but but that's that's a long way off, I think, yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think it's we worth noting too that people are excited you know, I forget the word clawback of remote work, but it, it, I don't know if there's companies out there doing that. That seems a little bit strange, but it, it's about, you know, the unity of our team. And I, I think what Faye has been talking about and one of the silver linings in the pandemic, if I could be so bold as to say something like that, is that the sense of unity and togetherness that we've seen amongst the people on our teams and within the agencies is, is probably the greatest level of support um, just naturally that I think we've ever, we've ever experienced. And, and it's how people feel about being together, about solving problems together. Um, the level of support that line managers and leaders have been able to wrap around those folks. Um, and it's, it's been a little bit of a silver lining, at least from my perspective, to see how everyone has come together to overcome those challenges. It's so many of them, we could talk for days about the challenges of the pandemic. But um, it's really a testament to the human spirit, uh, spirit and perseverance, um, and how people naturally want to be part of that social interaction and that sense of unity that that a company provides, at, uh, you know, all shaped under a common purpose and goal. And and I do always I do find myself saying this every time a conversation like this is happening because you know um, Medcoms has been an interesting position where there's a lot of work. Um, you know, we've had different problems in medcoms to people in other sorts of businesses around us. We've all got mm -hmm. friends and family, whatever. You know, we're, um, we're, we're the, the the problem people often talk about is just dealing with the amount of work we've got to do. Um, so dealing with the amount of work plus all the pressures that's going on around us and the sorts of initiatives that you're talking about, I think, are clearly very, very important. Um, yeah. So, and and don't, so, for, don't forget, Peter, that, you know, a lot of the work that we do has the sense of purpose in the pandemic. I mean, many of us on this call today have worked on 
several of the vaccines that have yeah, been yeah. You know, completely game changing and, and have changed the lives and helped us to accelerate back to this, you know, return to normalcy or whatever it is that we're trying to get to now. So it, the, the sense of pride that we see in a lot of our people who have worked on some really groundbreaking therapies uh, and treatments is just it. I hope it makes everybody feel good because it really jazzes me up and makes me feel great about the, the impact that we're having on the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. I, I want to go in a slightly different direction if I can. We're getting quite a few questions starting to come in, which um, we're going to try and cover off some of these as we go. Some of them are a little bit ahead of us at the moment. I'd like to pick up, I mean, uh, Bomi, if I can draw, draw you in to another big sure. issue that's that's been sort of talked about over the last year or so is the whole diversity inclusivity type question. So um, can I just ask you to talk a little bit about what you're doing? Because I know you're quite quite involved in that at McCann. So explain a little bit about what's happening, what you see the challenges are and the sort of solutions you're putting in place. Yeah, sure. So unfortunately with uh, the pandemic, we also had the overlap of um, a lot of like racial issues in the US, um, especially at like hands of police. Um, but I'm happy to say that um, our effort in our organization to address um, diversity and inclusion within our company preceded that it kind of stuck, kicked off. Um, it was initiated with McCann World Group and they have this day for meaning and it just forces like everyone within the network to really focus on like what is important within our agency and what can we do to address certain needs such as diversity and inclusion. And what sprung from that in our organization is our diversity and inclusion council, which I'm a member of. I joined uh, earlier, I guess last year, late last year. Um, and our goal is to truly just encourage internally and externally infuse diversity and inclusion in our DNA. That was one of the little bubbles that was on our slide. And so what does that actually mean? Uh, so our council takes um, employees from all the network agencies. So I'm from CHV and we have other people from CMC Connect, Codex, uh, for example. Um, and we just try to hit uh, very specific initiatives. So one of them would be just providing more resources for our employees um, on the internet and news just to celebrate what's going on every month, like different holidays that people may not address. And that's sort of like the typical thing that a DNI council would do. Um, but we're also digging a bit deeper. Um, later on for, in 2019, there was a diversity and inclusion um, engagement survey for employees just to get a pulse on um, what employees thought was happening, what we're doing well, what we're not doing well. And one of the key points that came up was that um, they would like to see more diversity amongst the employees, amongst myself. And I can speak to that as, um, at least on the US side, being uh, the only like person of color from the US. So it's like, yes, that is a definite need. And so now we're trying to implement strategies to address um, what employees have brought up. So in direct connection with, you know, wanting to see more diversity in the recruitment process, we're doing a recruitment outreach process that partnering with different universities to make sure that we are bringing in new hires, um, diversity hires. Um, and that is also reflected in our fuel program. I think we have about 25% of the new hires are people of color. And so that's a wonderful start right now. Um, we also really, we also are currently doing focus groups. And so that's again, um, asking our employees to participate and to address uh, specific topics that's come up. So I know for my focus group, it was like, what does it take to bring your authentic self to work? And so that's touching not only on diversity and, uh, and inclusion, just making sure that everybody is heard. Um, yeah, so we, we, I'm trying just going through all the, we're doing a lot of different initiatives. We're also making sure externally that um, our message um, accounts for diversity and inclusion. Um, so if we do post anything on social media that especially related to clinical trials or to, um, let me just take a step back. So for posting on social media, we usually uh, collaborate with our social media team to make sure that everything looks appropriate. Um, from a diversity and inclusion expensive ex perspective. And then um, with the Global Scientific Council, uh, that's where we collaborate with them to bring awareness of like racial disparities uh, within healthcare and within 
clinical trial programs and also making that awareness, um, spreading that awareness to our clients. That's okay. Well. Okay. I mean, again, if you take the last year um, and re reflecting mm -hmm. on it, you know, alongside of everything else, the, the diversity inclusivity debate has has come out in the in the open in in a largely positive way, I think, in and around the medcoms mm -hmm. agencies and so on, um, and that's a good thing. Just just a, it's just again a straightforward question, but um, um, I don't know what the right answer is, what the rights or wrongs of this would be. But um, I see a number of agencies who, are, like yourself, are putting your own initiatives together. I don't see a sort of a healthcare communications industry type of initiative being taken. Do, do you? I don't know whether you know of any initiatives like that at a sort of broader level than the company? Yeah, so specifically in medical communications, I have not found any sort of like general guidance um, such as like the GPP um, that we could use to be like, how can you um, infuse diversity and inclusion like internally, externally? I've seen a lot of like newsletter posts, like there's the, the map um, newsletter, and they provide some guidance on um, how to do DNI from an external perspective. So, like starting with plain language summaries, um, making sure like you know patients have access to that, making sure it's inclusive. Um, talking about the racial disparities in healthcare and clinical trials, and making sure your clients are aware of that, and like incorporating it into the projects that you're working on as needed. Um, but there isn't a lot about what to do internally, I've always found towards the end, it's like, oh, make sure you hire, you know, diversity hires and um, listen to your employees. And I think that needs to be more, I would like to see more um, like organizations that like help with medical writers, just like focus on that specifically. Um, just maybe, maybe, from within. Of, maybe I can, maybe maybe I can just add as well. I think we're seeing, you know, discussions and activity from ISMAP, at HCA and other organizations. Uh, so I think that's right. Uh, I don't think it's an overarching uh, industry-wide perspective yet, uh, perhaps that, that, uh, that could be very useful. Um, and I think, as, as has been commented, the past year and a bit has, has shone a light on uh, social inequity in health in particular. And, and, and so there's things outside our organization that we need to absolutely be aware of and contribute to. I think, I think a big focus here is what can we actually do to take action ourselves mm -hmm. and, and how do we shape our organization to, to become more diverse, more inclusive in, in every single parameter of what that means. And, and there's lots of good reasons to do it and social rights and moral and ethical rights. There's also very good business reasons to do it because it exactly. makes it better as a business. Mm -hmm. So, so these, these areas are absolutely pivotal to how we're evolving and I think how our sector will evolve as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so multifaceted it if I can say the word. <laughs> uh, it's interesting, Alice, Alice Choi is on, on the line and she's just put in a comment to say the HCA, she's involved with the HCA, they're, to, yep. they're certainly doing some stuff, they've got a, a, a non-exec there. Um, ISMAP, I, I know ISMAP have talked about it at all. I mean, I, I don't actually know whether there's, a, there's, a, there's an opportunity for a membership type organization to come out with some sort of guidance or not, but it's certainly interesting and it's important, I guess, within the company that you're, you're looking at it. But there have been a couple of comments coming in about you know, diversity, inclusivity is, um, and this is one of my things is that that's a lot of different things you can encompass, but you tend to get focused in on ethnicity or something like that, whereas um, disabilities and so on is all part of this discussion. Yeah. Um, and, um, and the sort of thing that maybe we don't have time to talk about now, but it's certainly, as I see it, clearly a point is this is a very highly qualified, as Charlie said initially, highly qualified uh, community. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't and you're picking from a selected audience in the first place to some degree you can't i don't know how we change the educational system to end up with more you know it's, there's a wide question here, it's, it's also so. part of our, yeah. part of our early careers program and and uh, sorry if i'll hand over to you in a second but it's also part of our early careers program and apprenticeships internships other things that we're doing to try and engage with and encourage you know people who don't necessarily have a higher degree or, or even a degree coming into the organization and that's a part of the picture, absolutely. Sorry, Bonnie. Oh, no, um, I was just gonna touch about like, um, like, yes, like focusing on disabilities as well. Um, like internally, I think this also where like being like mental health well-being and line managers come into play as well, um, because there's a lot, uh, we already have some employees that have disabilities as well, such as like ADHD or like I myself have 
chronic migraines. And so in terms of the inclusion part, it's important that, you know, I and other people who consider yeah, consider themselves to have a disability, have the resources that they need at work. And so like I get that support and I'm happy to say I get a lot of support at CHV and through the organization um, to the point like I don't have to hesitate to reach out to my line manager about my schedule if I have to tweak it um, or just converse with like my team on projects to be like, I need to step out for an hour to take a break because of my head, but I'll be back. Like we do have those accommodations throughout the comedy throughout the company, excuse me. Um, and so I think we're trying to um, figure out what other resources people might need from an inclusion perspective. And also as Charlie said, to bring in uh, people who may not have the opportunities, like usually a medical writer should have a PhD, but now we're trying to branch out to people with a master's or even right. a bachelor's and also ensuring that when they enter that they know that they have the resources that they need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are very wide questions and we could go mm -hmm. in a lot more depth in, you know, in quite a number of directions already. But just touching on the sort of the people you're bringing in at an entry level, um, uh, a couple of questions. I mean, A, one of the points I was thinking as you were talking there, Bami, was, you know, some of, some of this virtual working actually is great in terms of including more people of different sorts from different places and all that sort of discussion as well. Mm -hmm. But just out of interest, and Charlie, maybe you can talk from an overall view uh, on this one. A question came in a little bit earlier, I, I saw. In terms of bringing people in remotely, comment? I mean, you know, a lot of us thought, it, or some people thought it would be very difficult. Most people are doing it. How's yeah, sort of I, I, think, I, think, I think perhaps start with saying, first of all, we're very fortunate to work in a business in a sector that's both in demand, but also where we're able to adapt to remote working. And a lot of sectors haven't been able to do that. So, so you've got a feel for them, but we're in a sector where that's, that's a possibility. Now, having already worked across 10 offices across three countries, historically, our business was kind of modeled around the ability to remote work. And we work remotely from many of our clients, you know, physically, geographically speaking. So we were able to adapt quite easily. And we've brought on many, many people since the pandemic who've never physically met anyone yeah. in the office. And, and it's worked incredibly successfully, I think, to, to, to many people's surprise, perhaps. But people have adapted, engaged, and just tried to make it work. That's not to say we don't want people to get physically together at some point, we will. And one of the big questions from an inclusive, inclusivity perspective is, is as we move to a hybrid model, perhaps in the next, in the next year of working, uh, how are we going to make sure that everybody feels equally included, whether they're at home or in the office? And that is a, that is a challenge that will face all of us in, in, in medical communications and in other sectors too. But that's a hot topic which we could spend a whole whole session on. I'm sure we'll come back to we'll come back to that one. But I, I think it's a, a interesting times. So let's just put it like that. I think um, most of us are working that one out. Um, and just let's switch the focus now. And, and we're talking about remote working and we, it's been very focused on the employees and the staff and all the rest of it. It sounds great what you're doing, but switch it around. And, and Charlie, just head off with this one, but you know, dealing with your clients, how have you seen that aspect of life changing, both yeah. in terms of what you're doing, how you're working with your clients, and also there must've been some quite dramatic changes in just in terms of the sorts of deliverables and, and the work they need doing so. So run with that a little bit and just look at that side of the yeah. equation. And for, firstly, it's been, it's been very inspiring actually how our clients have engaged remotely. We've got a different insight into people's lives with uh, their kids or their dogs running around and, and creating mayhem whilst doing meetings. You know, we wouldn't have seen that before. So, uh, and so that's given us a different kind of relationship, I think, with, with, with many of our clients. And we've been working very successfully, and I would say more strategically with many of our clients as, uh, in, in, the past, in the past year than we have historically. Many, many trends have been driven and accelerated, I think, by, by what has happened. Clearly, virtual meetings, and we delivered over 300 virtual events last year for, for over 40,000 participants from 80 countries. So I think it was, and that's probably tenfold what we would have done the year before. And, and what is the future of Congresses is a big part of that debate and the same discussion around hybrid events and how do you utilize that to expand engagement and 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 the others will have a view on this I'm sure but you know I, I was asked the question that you know why should a Congress be three or five days in Atlanta or Barcelona and why shouldn't it be a learning journey through time uh, interspersed with sessions with experts um, and 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 I think there's going to be a lot of innovation arising from that in terms of engagement and very personalized experience and, and uh, I mean, Michael's got a lot of views on this one as well. So, <laughs> yeah, and on, you know, it, th th those are really good points, Charlie. I think, you know, if you think about what's happened over the last 14 or 15 months, it, this is probably the most widely shared human experience 
in in our lifetimes. My, mine certainly, right? Um, you know, and and an analog, unfortunately, might be the events of September 11th uh, on that type of a scale. And you know, it, it's just been really emotional and comforting to know that our people have all experienced this together. And when you, when you think about it, yeah, Charlie made a good point. You know, I think working with our clients and, and some of their customers, we've gotten more personal, not just because of the shared experience, uh, but if you think about all the Zooms and Teams and WebExes and FaceTimes that you've been on over the past year and a half, it, you know, they usually started out with people talking about how are you doing? You know, this kind of goes back to the notion of taking care of the people who are taking care of the business and, you know, having that more deeply meaningful personal connection. Um, it, it also plays into to what, what Bomi was talking about with diversity and inclusion. You know, we're learning more and more about the people that we work with. We're learning about all the different facets of their culture and their life. And, and what I think has been a major innovation, in quotes, for, for us in MedComs is that those personal experiences have really infused our business with really amazing results and connections with clients and connections with each other and, and with the customers that matter most and that the HCPs in the world are taking care of. Um, and, and it's just been... You know, I do get a little bit emotional about it because we've all had those, you know, those impactful stories from from our lives and from our colleagues' lives, and it's just it's it's been. I, I try to find the silver lining in the doom and gloom of the pandemic, um, and and this is you know, what we're talking about today. I think is is really important. And just to asking this slightly glib question, and then get, I, I suppose I'm interested in you know you're working with pharma companies who are trying to deliver and support HCPs and so on, you know everything's changed hasn't it do you do you see it do you see it coming back you know do you see it never changing do you find a balance in the middle i don't know what the answer is but what's your view charlie i'll start with a point of view on this which is i think we're at a moment in time and and you know if anybody watched the the hda session this morning on, on the edelman trust barometer a lot was talked about there in terms of trust in healthcare and industry and how that's shifting but i think i think we're at a moment in time where heightened interest in in medical science how it is derived how it is interpreted, communicated, and what influence it has on decision making is, is at an all time high. And that's a great opportunity uh, for, for us as a sector. I think it's also driving a shifting role for medical affairs. Uh, and that is also supporting uh, our, our future as well. So um, I, I think we're at a moment in time where it's going to be transformative for, for medical communications. And I honestly believe that we are now finding our place really at the heart of healthcare communications. Whereas, whereas that hasn't necessarily historically been the case. And, and I think the work we do will continue to be seen as increasingly important in that context. Um, and trust as a factor, you know, I think one of, one of the challenges that faces us still, we're still pretty hidden as, 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 a, as a business sector. Uh, and perhaps we need to walk the talk and become far more open uh, and transparent uh, about what we do, how we do it, and how we engage with industry and with, with healthcare professionals and, and patients. Uh, and in a way that will can only help, you would hope, in terms of building further understanding and trust in the value that we bring. So I see that as a very exciting future trend. And, and we're at a moment in time where I think we've got to take that opportunity. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to be very blunt about it and go slightly further than you've gone. Because, I mean, we've been around, I say we, I, I might be slightly <laughs> older than you. But, you know, the, in the original, you know, in the old days, we were very project-based business, weren't mm. we? You know, it was like, you know, we're going to run a meeting, we'll get the projects company in to sort of like write it up. So that is completely different. And, and, and I find that interesting to reflect slightly on. Um, I'm, I'm, but I'm going to put you on the spot, Charlie. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do this, actually. I should have warned you, okay. maybe, but I'm going to do it anyway. What the heck? <laughs> um, I remember a long time ago when I started Medcoms Networking and, and, and you and I having a chat in the early days. And I remember you coming out with a comment at one of the meetings, which I've always sort of had in my head, you know, and um, we're very much about the medcoms business, very much about the substance and the data and so on. And you had some line, it was something like, you know, we've got a lot of substance and maybe not enough style. Maybe it's a bit, you know, maybe we need a bit more style 
I can't remember quite the quote, but you get what I'm saying. You know, with substance yeah. over style, and maybe a bit more style would be good. Yeah. Just out of interest, if I'm if I'm quoting you reasonably accurately, um, could you just sort of reflect maybe slightly on that? Has it changed over the last 12, 15 years? Well, if you're going to have have the steak, you've got to have the sizzle, but the steak itself still has to be good, right? And, and, okay. right. and so it's a very it's a very poor analogy, but but the, the point is that absolutely provision of information that doesn't change behaviour. Um, and what we all want is to stimulate and engage in evidence-based behavior change and practice. And in order to do that, you've got to speak to hearts and minds. And, and, and that means we have to be engaging, interesting, compelling, and also accurate, well-founded, yeah. yeah. and yeah. absolutely true to what the science is saying. That is a complex and difficult issue, but there is still a gap between what the science says and what happens in clinical practice. And so long as there is that gap, our, our mission is not complete. So, yeah. so we've all got to join that. And, and I think as, as a sector and as a group of businesses, we've got a major role to play in that. Absolutely. And, and, um, and the last year has thrown that into sharp contrast, basically, in a, in a nutshell. So we've probably got a minute or two left. I, should, I, should, I, I, always, I always lose touch with the time a little bit. So because some of this stuff is absolutely fascinating. And I could talk all day about it. But sort of to come back to, Faye, I'm going to bring you back in because I'm sort of, sort of you know, I, I'm very proud of this industry, frankly. And a lot of what Charlie's talking about is the sort of thing that I, I applaud. And, and I believe we've actually shown and demonstrated we are moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. When it comes back to sort of um, from an HR type point of view and sort of people in the business feeling proud of the business. I mean, I, I don't I, I suppose I'm going to ask you, put words in your mouth, it's a bit cliche, but you know, do you find people are proud to be in this business? Do you find people come into the business and recognize that those those principles and standards are there? Does that I, I don't know. I don't want to. I'm trying not to put words in your mouth. I probably am. But, you know, I'm just trying to bring it back to the people coming into the business, what we represent. And is that a, is that seen as a positive by the people coming into the business at the earlier stages? Yeah. You see what I'm true. saying? Or yeah. Am I? Yeah. So the, the again, just coming back to the engagement survey, the the responses from that people are proud of the work that they do that is one of the questions on that as well. I, I don't know the actual figure off the top of my head, but um, but people are proud of the work that they do and people are encouraged to bring them their whole selves to work as well, which is, is super important. Um, one of the quotes that we had off, off the engagement survey was that I love that I'm being encouraged to be myself, which is a great thing too. So yeah, I, I do get that people are very proud of, of, of the people and the work. Okay, okay. Charlie, you look like you want I to say remember, I can't remember if it was 96 or 97 percent of people in our last survey with all staff said they're proud of the work that we do. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's incredible. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's a good message to get out there. So the message is, you know, let's, 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 let's start summing up. We've got members of the audience don't all rush away because we're going to sum up. We've got 10 minutes or so when we can answer some, some more questions. We're not going to rush away. But for the recording, I'd like to sort of, sort of wrap up a little bit. Um, so I, I, and I just find it fascinating listening to you and I hope other people do as well. Um, but we could go in so many directions in so much more depth than I accept that. So maybe there's some more webinars we can do uh, in the future. But on, on a day like Medcom's day, let's, let's just, you know, it's, it's the global industry, the positive stuff that you're talking about, the fact that, you know, lots more people needed in the industry. So we're, you know, everyone's recruiting at all levels. If people are looking at this as a business that sounds interesting, you know, we want more people. Yes, it's competitive to get in, but we want more people. Um, companies like yours are very much, you know, uh, uh, you know, mental health first aiders, DNI, all these initiatives is very much, we're talking McCann, but it's very much a sector wide thing. And I think that's a really positive message to put out there. Um, and, and as Charlie and, and, and Michael's talking about, the way the business is developing, the opportunities um, that are, are opening up in front of us, basically, as, as Medcoms really comes into its own. I, 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 I've said before, I'll say it again, I think the best is yet to come. Um, and, I, um, uh, and I love hearing you guys talking so positively about it. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm going to say what I hope you're all going to agree, which is that you're very happy for anyone watching this to contact you. Uh, LinkedIn is the mm -hmm. easy way of doing it. Um, so please do, anyone watching this, make those contacts. Um, if anyone's interested in what we're doing at Medcoms Networking, medcomsnetworking.com is the place to go. Um, as I said earlier, Network Pharma TV, loads of videos. First Medcom's job is worth having a look at if you're interested in the business because there's loads of information there. Um, so lots of going on. Um, I'd love to hear from you if you're watching this and thinking it's interesting, but please do contact these guys because they're all going to welcome those LinkedIn requests that are now firing off, okay? Um, <laughs> and I'd like to just say, wrap this recording up, 
and, and say a huge thank you to you and just ask you just to give a little wave goodbye. Perhaps, perhaps perhaps just before you end the recording, I'll say on behalf of the audience and everybody in the sector, thank you for what you've done, Driving Network Farmer and the Medcoms Day. Uh, we wouldn't be here if you hadn't done that. Thank you. OK, and it has been like climbing up a mountain at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> OK, enough of that. Thank you very much, guys. Quick wave and I'm going to close the recording. OK, so bye bye. Take care. Right.